I know that the first question is always the most difficult, so who wants to begin with a question? Maybe I can ask to introduce yourself be be before. Yes. <laughs> uh, because uh, your speech was very comprehensive and very interesting, full of data, you mentioned all sorts of countries. I've heard, I think, only once or twice Russia or Ukraine, and these are very complica complicated. So I was wondering, how would you define the current relationship with Russia and Ukraine? And that's it. So, <laughs> a very <laughs> large question. Um, I've said a couple of days, I don't know, maybe weeks ago, that uh, if we were to have a new Cold War, that uh, it, uh, it uh, would take a uh, much shorter time, but that uh, those that come out victoriously would be, victoriously would be the same. Um, and I think that also Putin has understood that. Because uh, there's a difference between uh, do the annexation of, of um, uh, the Krim, the Crimea, uh, or to have a, a vast outreach into a country like Ukraine. Um, and you have seen over the recent days that uh, Putin has calmed down. He has said, I'm going to respect the result of the elections. I think he will continue to, uh, uh, to spread some trouble, you know. Um, and that may also make a number of problems in, in the future. You could, for example, fear that uh, if he uh, is going away from the military option, that uh, he would focus more on trade, for example, uh, and, and uh, have a lot of, of uh, uh, trade disputes with its neighbors, not only with uh, Ukraine, but also with uh, other neighboring countries. You could, I don't know whether I would say expect, but I would not be completely surprised if that happens. But uh, the idea that uh, um, you can go back and the, or that he could go back to, to a version of, of what the uh, uh, USSR was, uh, that's completely false, I believe. I don't know whether you have uh, um, observed that, but uh, uh, when this, uh, this thing in, in, the, in the Crimea happened, all of a sudden Mr. Lukashenko, who is the president of uh, Belarus, said, uh, that he didn't like it, although he's one of the people that uh, likes uh, Putin most. No? Uh, so he has been scaring his neighbors, not, not only Georgia and, and, uh, and Ukraine, Moldova or, or the, the Baltic states, but also the others. He has been scaring them. Um, Kazakhstan, for example, would like to become a member of the WTO as soon as possible because they don't want to be alone in the room with the Russians, you know. So uh, I'm rather, I wouldn't say comfortable about this, but um, we, we should not be too scared either. Um, one of the big mistakes we have been doing over the last years is that we didn't do anything, uh, truly very little, if not anything, about our energy uh, problem. Uh, we have had already two times uh, uh, problems in, in Ukraine that uh, the tap was closed, you know, and nevertheless, uh, very little happened over the last years, very little. Of course, the European Commission will be blamed for that. We are blamed for everything. We are the universal scapegoat. Huh? Uh, I, you know what happens in the Bible with the scapegoat. You put all the sins on his back and uh, you, sent, you sent him to the desert. No? Um, but maybe you have also already seen that a scapegoat is never joyful. And we are the universal scapegoat, but 
it is the member states, you know, that over the last five years have refused to take serious action with respect to energy. Um, have not reacted when it, uh, uh, to, to the policy of, of, of Russia to, uh, to cut the, the internal market into pieces uh, with non re-exportation clauses, for example. We have now reacted uh, with the European Commission with uh, a case against Gazprom. Probably, if I'm most probably before the end of the mandate, there will also be a, a decision on that. But it has been the Commission. Um, and why is that? Because, well, the Russians, they are, of course, they know something about tactics. Eh? They, they give, give some, a somewhat better price to a, a member state and, and a somewhat higher price to another one, you know. It's a carrot and a stick. Uh, but it is, as, as a big economy, it's, it's simply foolish to, to trap into that, you know, to trap into that play. Uh, we should make sure that uh, we have a, a common energy policy that we negotiate with the Russians as a bloc, that we do something about our uh, uh, energy independency, uh, invest uh, more, but probably in a more economic way or competitive way in alternative uh, energy. We should uh, interconnect our grids. Uh, which is uh, one of the reasons that uh, uh, the Russians can singular singularize an individual member state because the, the grids are not connected. Now, that, that's not costing, it's costing a lot of money. Eh? That's, uh, I don't have it in my pocket, but uh, it, it would cost a couple of billion of euros, which is feasible for such a big economy over a couple of years. It's perfectly feasible to do so. We haven't done so. Um, I will also hope that uh, we can have uh, other sources like the United States, but. Uh, it's not only shale gas that is going to resolve our problems. Huh? I mean, uh, you have to transport it also, and that's a rather expensive thing. But there are all other sources uh, um, for, uh, for energy. You know that uh, uh, my country, Belgium, is not dependent at all uh, from the Russians. Not at all. One, one or two percent. Um, so we are not that stupid, you know? <laughs> People always think that, but uh, we are not. I mean, uh, one or two percent, but we have, uh, we have uh, gas from Norway, from Algeria, from Qatar. So we have diversified. And then a number of other member states have never invested in that. Never. So there remains a lot to be done, but this is feasible. And you know why? Because <coughs> when you look at the Russian economy and you take out the extractive sector, uh, minerals, oil and gas, and uh, gold, and, and diamonds. Uh, nothing much is left, you know. Then it is a rather weak economy once you take that off. And even for, that, for those sectors, they need ore technology. So they are, they are, they are not su such a strong economy. I've always asked myself why they are part of the BRICS, you know. Because I have never seen anything emerging over there. No, no, I, I'm, I'm serious. I'm not laughing. What, what has really emerged there? As, uh, let's say, new developments and, and um, growth, uh, sustainable growth, not much, nothing in fact. So uh, we should be prudent. You have always to be prudent in life. Uh, we should not be scared. And we should be firm, telling them very clearly, look, that's the red line. Um, and uh, if we do that together, and I think we have finally understood, um, then uh, we can perfectly master this. That's a little bit the problem with Europe, you know. Europe is like a donkey. Eh? He has to, to stumble twice before he understands. No? Uh, but once we have understood, we can act and react and, and, and put our act together. And I, I think, I'm, I'm quite sure that this is going to happen in the coming years. Thank you very much for your, your very frank answer. I saw that uh, Mario Tello was the first who asked to have uh, a question, and now we have many, many different questions. So. Well, uh, thank you very much for providing us with this, uh, uh, the benefit of your extraordinary experience, uh, international experience. In particular, I would like to address uh, the governance question. Take uh, stock of your uh, experience for maybe suggesting uh, some improvement for the future. Uh, I have to say that sometimes you talk as a foreign minister. That could be, it's not, it's not uh, a joke. Sometimes uh, the, the strength of the trade commissioner is such that you included in your speech so many uh, political dimensions, not only trade, but the link between trade security 
energy security and political dimension is so strong in your approach and I like it. However, the Treaty of Lisbon was expected a little bit to change the uh, governance of the external relations and the high representative was uh, uh, expected to address uh, three main tasks, not only uh, chairing the Council for Foreign Relations and uh, head of the External Action Service, but also vice president of the Commission. Well, uh, many people in this room is co are convinced that this third or second maybe mi mission has not been very much accomplished. The record is quite poor. Uh, in, as the vice president of the commission. Do you think that is only typical of the first period of the Lisbon Treaty implementation? There is a kind of baby in uh, uh, the European External Action Service and so on, the new function, or maybe is a, pro is a deeper problem of governance which could be solved by changing governance by deputies, uh, high representative in the commission, or maybe it's a problem that the treaty is expecting too much from one single person, then we need maybe to improve the treaty. I, I propose to take uh, two other questions. There it was, uh, uh, and, and after that I will take a question uh, <laughs> at the front of the, of the room, not, not only uh, uh, behind. So, uh, Yes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Commissioner, for sharing uh, with us your thoughts. Since I'm coming from Ben-Gurion University of the Negev Desert, I couldn't resist your invitation to take you with me back to the desert. Uh, and uh, my question has to do, you've mentioned that trade policy can also play a role in high politics. Thus, my question has to do, how do you see the role of the Union uh, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? And of not less importance is, of course, the issue of the Arab Spring countries. Thank you, sir. Yes, and now I will take a question in the back of the, the room. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Ruben Wong from the University of Singapore. I wanted to ask about um, the EU's relations with China. Um, and you, for part of your speech, you mentioned the, uh, what I would call conditionality clauses, which were written into the agreements, FTAs with countries in Latin America. These have been agreements which, these have been the clauses which have um, uh, stymied uh, conclusions of agreements in Asia. South Korea and, and Singapore, of course, accepted. So do you see in future uh, a disentanglement of trade agreements with some of these social uh, value kind of conditionalities? Because uh, these things have actually stopped the EU and China from having a third generation partnership and cooperation agreement. And yet, relations have been going on pretty well. Uh, and do you see a strategic um, uh, uh, mission for the EU in, in Asia. So I think you have <laughs> many, you, many, um, many different questions and where, where are very, you from? very important questions. Where are you so from? Uh, I'm from the Korean University of Negev and my name is Sharon Farmer. Is that in the Negev, uh, Negev desert? desert? I didn't know that. <laughs> um, well, you then you are, I mean, yes, you, you can have it, the role of my scapegoat, no problem. You're used to it. <laughs> so you're, you are used to the desert, I mean. Yeah. Maybe you better put ahead, but apart from that, I mean, it's okay. Let's, let's talk about the conditions uh, immediately after the meeting. <laughs> um, 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 that's not the first time that, that this has been said to me, that uh, I sometimes uh, talk more like a, a minister of foreign affairs. Probably it has to see with the fact that I have been a minister of foreign affairs. <laughs> uh, and also, Jose Manuel Barroso is, is sometimes uh, saying that to me. And he understands it because before he became prime minister and uh, president of the European Commission, he was also minister of foreign affairs. Now, um, on the other hand, I believe that uh, for a number of reasons, you know, um, trade is very close to geopolitics. It is very close to it. Uh, in, in fact, uh, for, for uh, the biggest economy in the world, uh, it is, uh, uh, it, it's about external economic policy. That, that's what it is really about. 
uh, how do you position yourself in, 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 in uh, the world, the present world and the future world? And, uh, for example, an agreement with uh, the United States has a geopolitical element in it. No? it it's, uh, because I believe that uh, the next big battle in trade is about uh, norms and, and, and standards and uh, regulations and disciplines. You know? Now, it's obvious that if we want to be in the lead of that evolution, that uh, we will have to do it together. Maybe joined afterwards by some other countries, but yes, this is geopolitics, but not the same way that the Americans look at it. The Americans look at it from a, a very political angle, you know. So what uh, I'm not interested in is this theory of encirclement of China. That I don't believe in. Um, and it doesn't make sense, I believe. But on the other hand, uh, uh, if we do not want to end up in a situation where the Chinese are going to uh, um, oblige us to, to take over their standards, we will have to be in the opposite position. No, It's either or. That I, I very much believe in. And I could give you an example. For example, in ECAS, we have been working together with the United States even before these TTIP negotiations. And what we have seen is once that the, the Chinese realized that we were going forward, they have asked to participate in the discussions, which is good. I mean, I'm very much in favor of universal standards, but that also universally observed. Huh? Um, and, and, and not only for standards, also for disciplines, for example. We have to do something about disciplines in um, subsidies. The biggest problem with uh, China, it's about subsidies. It's not about wages. Uh, it's not about uh, uh, technological evolution. It is about subsidies in all kinds of ways, you know, with uh, uh, cheap loans, uh, uh, free land, uh, package deals, uh, uh, export uh, uh, credits, non-performing loans that uh, uh, keep on the books, and so on and so on. I mean, and this is a real, it's a real vast problem, you know, if, if you want to, um, uh, to address that, we will certainly have to do that together. So, yes, there is an important element of... Uh, uh, geopolitics, geopolitics in this. Now, um, on the role of the higher up vice president, um, the, 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 that you are the, the president of the council, you know, that in these matters, uh, CFSP and um, CFS, CFDSP eh, um, decides by uh, unanimity or at least consensus and that on the other hand you are vice president of a commission uh, where the rules the normal rules of decision making in the commission apply which means by majority you know, if there is no agreement in the European Commission you vote and that happens you know people think it never happens but it does and first of all the fact that it can happen is already influencing the, the, the whole mood of the discussions you know if you are in a discussion, you know that at a certain moment in time you can be confronted with the vote, you, you take that into account. But it happens that we vote. Recently we had it on a very, very important issue the, uh, that had to see with uh, state aid in, in uh, renewables. You know, and uh, what should be the, the criteria for that? It's very political and it was a vote. And uh, it's also in the in Treaty of Lisbon that uh, as a vice um, uh, president of the uh, uh, European Commission, uh, she is bound by the rules of the decision taking in the European Commission. So there is an inherent um, um, contradiction, you know, uh, that uh, can only lead to uh, a schizophrenic situation because on the one hand, uh, okay, you have to uh, follow the lines of the European Commission where you have a lot of other commissioners that have also external competences, no? Uh, and that, of course, are also eager on their competences. No? Uh, not everybody is as easy as I am. Uh, <coughs> um, and on the other hand, uh, you have uh, the Council of Ministers, where you have uh, uh, 28 ministers of foreign affairs that are also eager. No? So, I mean, automatically you end up in a very schizophrenic situation. Now, um, Cathy has never really engaged in this role of vice president. Little bit, but not much. Uh, I have always worked very well together with her, for example, also on conflict minerals. We have never had any problem with her. Uh, but she doesn't really engage in that role. And I think there are several reasons. Uh, first, she's British. No? 
Mm. No, but she's very, she's very European-minded, but nevertheless, she's British. So uh, she's reasoning uh, in this traditional approach of um, um, international policy that is much more um, relational than it is structural. No? In the continent, you have a number of member states that have a much more structural approach of, of, uh, of foreign policy. No, that, that's not her background. No? But uh, secondly, uh, uh, I don't know uh, if you engage in that, how physically you would do that, you know? That's the second problem. Uh, because uh, this lady has been working day and night, huh? uh, once you realize it. Huh? Um, and, and how on top of that uh, would you have that coordinating role of everything that has to see with uh, um, external policy? Now, on the other hand, I think that if you really in the future want to have an, a decisive role, you should combine both. Because it's obvious that the strength of a structural uh, external policy of the European Union lies much more in the external aspects of our competences as a Commission than it lies, let's say, in the traditional um, um, high um, external policy. So you should combine it. But how you do it, um, first of all, it was the first term, but on top of that, you, then you would really need uh, deputies. And that's not foreseen in the treaty. So nobody really knows how you would do that because you could find a couple of commissioners. That should not be too difficult, but the council never accept that. Maybe they could accept if they also have a couple of deputies, but what is then your role? And what is the, uh, the say you have uh, over these people, you know, when they come from the council? Uh, commission, that's, that's uh, uh, clear, but um, what's then the situation? Uh, are they on a, different, uh, on a different level, those deputies? So it is, uh, something that will have to develop over time, but it is certainly an interesting uh, problem of constitutional law that we are not going to tackle in the first decade because nobody is going to start a new revision of the treaty. You know? um, in the Palestinian conflict, uh, I, I'm a little bit hesitant to say too much about this uh, because we have had, in, you know, that in, in the past a couple of uh, discussions on this, uh, on a technical agreement, and uh, also uh, previously um, on whether or not uh, there could be direct exports from the occupied territories. No, and there can be, and uh, it's very clear that there can be. And we have also put into place a system whereby you can have a certification. You need a certification, in fact, that they do not come from the occupied territories. So that's an element. Is it a deciding element? I don't think so. Um, we probably could do more, but that could only happen if uh, uh, you start from a common analysis of the situation. I mean, in the Middle East. And not all 20, 28 member states have the same analysis. Uh, we should be clear about that. So this is a, it's a very difficult, it's a minefield um, where what you really need is, is, is a political breakthrough. There has been another uh, effort, broad effort by John Kerry to come to a political breakthrough and nevertheless he, has, he had to come to the same conclusion that it, it wouldn't work. So uh, uh, it's not up to me at, uh, what is it, uh, uh, 20 to 1 to all of a sudden uh, come with a solution, so I, I'm not going to do that. Um, there was a question on conditionalities, no? Oh, yes. Uh, um, but I could give you a, a couple of answers. No? Uh, first of all, um, a number of member states, but also the European Parliament, would never agree to a trade policy without conditionalities, never. Um, I have to calm it down a little bit because in the end I'm not a human rights negotiator either. No? It, it's still about uh, trade. No? But uh, look at, for example, the, the, men the, the conditionalities you mentioned with respect to Colombia and Peru, although uh, human rights was already in the treaty as an essential element which could lead to uh, suspending the, the, uh, the agreement. Um, uh, 
European Parliament insisted to have a, a compact whereby there are very uh, clear obligations to be fulfilled uh, by Colombia. No? Uh, and by the way, you have had the set, same approach in the United States. So a trade policy without conditionalities, forget about it. Uh, it didn't make a problem, did make, make a real problem with Singapore. That, uh, by the way, the conditionalities uh, are in what they call the PCA, and that is then followed by the, the trade agreement. But you cannot have a trade agreement without the PCA, so in any case, they are intimately linked. Uh, where we got a problem to uh, find uh, the right uh, uh, wording was about uh, fiscal policy uh, uh, with respect to Singapore. No? And there you, of course, uh, have a changing landscape internationally, very clearly so. Now, uh, with respect to China, um, to mainland China, um, the reason that uh, they have asked to start negotiations on a free trade agreement, you know, they have asked repeatedly, they even insist in doing so. The reason I'm not doing it is because I, will, I want first to see what uh, they are going to do with the investment treaty, whether they make a serious effort to deliver or not. Uh, and for me, that's a, a, a litmus proof, you know, um, because the, the kind of hollow agreements that they have been making with uh, a number of countries, uh, recently also with European countries like Switzerland, we are not interested in. If they start talking with us on a free trade agreement, and even on an investment agreement, they will have to make a number of concessions. If not, we are not interested in it. So I think it's better to first have the investment agreement, and then we'll, we'll look at a possible uh, free trade agreement. I mean, one of my uh, successors, uh, uh, obviously. But again, um, I, I don't think that it will, uh, um, uh, it will not come about because of conditionalities. Uh, again, there I think we can find the right solutions. But the, the real question is, is the right moment uh, to have uh, uh, free trade negotiations with China? That's the real question. So I know that it, there were many other questions, but I think that now it is time to end uh, this uh, conference. Uh, Many, many thanks uh, to the Commissioner, many, many thanks to everybody, and uh, I know it is a buffet uh, upstairs to, to finish uh, in a more informal manner. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>